Welcome to Forging Plowshares, a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom of God. We hope this part of our ongoing conversation stimulates your mind and challenges your heart about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Please stay tuned at the end of the podcast for a short message about our ministry. In this sermon, I discuss the role of Christian nationalism in the present moment, in which we have a Bible that would incorporate the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And I equate this then with returning to the law or returning to idolatry, as Paul portrays it in Galatians, that Christian nationalism is in fact not Christian at all. If you enjoy listening to these podcasts, we encourage you to like us and follow us on social media. We would certainly appreciate your support. We are a donation-based ministry, depending upon the goodwill of our listeners. If you're interested in joining our Girardian Marriage Book Club, I'm not quite sure what to call it, but we're discussing the role of men in marriage and looking at the work of Rene Girard as nonviolent picture of peace, maybe as playing a role in our relationship with others. But it, that'll be on Wednesday night. This coming Wednesday is our first meeting. There is no charge if you're interested in uh, joining our group. I hope you enjoy this podcast then on the role of Christian nationalism as a kind of idolatry and the fact that Christ calls us outside the city. Hebrews 13, let's read verses 14 to 15. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him that let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And so the writer of Hebrews is warning Christians of his day to not confuse the kingdoms of this world with the kingdom of Christ. There may have been the thought that Israel is God's kingdom. And throughout the book of Hebrews, the writer is explaining, no, that Christ is establishing a new kingdom, a kingdom of heaven. There may have been the idea that the Messiah would be the king of Israel and would conquer Rome. And our city set on a hill then is no country or nation established by man. Our king is not the president, whoever that might be, Biden, Trump, our Bible cannot include the Constitution of the United States or the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution of we the people is not the word of Christ. And to confuse the two is on the order of confusing the law with the gospel. Paul calls it a form of idolatry. It's a form of blasphemy. I believe we're living in idolatrous times in which our neighbors have bowed the knee to Baal. The Baal Bible, we might call it. The Baal God, the Baal notion of salvation. Hebrews 13, 11 to 14. So let us go to him outside the camp, outside the city. And of course the image is Christ is crucified outside the city gates. Bearing his reproach. For we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Christian nationalism is not Christian. Two things to note about Christendom, which becomes Christian nationalism. There is the fusion of the church with Rome. And this brought death and destruction in its wake. It's the confusion of the city of God and the city of man. Where Christians are bound to institutions, political or social orders, then they are clinging to the cities of man. And instead, I think the church, the people of God, are a small guerrilla band gathered outside the city. Because this is the only place that the city of God can be enjoyed. Those who cry, we have no king but Caesar. And I think you can fill in the blank. You know, we have no king but, think of this political moment. There are those who would crucify the Lord. 
Think again of the confrontation of Christ with Pilate. The Jews had coalesced into a single body, uniting themselves with Rome. That's what they're saying. We have no king but Caesar. And one man must die that the nation might be saved. When it came down to choosing their king, they rejected Jesus. They had caved in to the logic of empire. And in this logic, we need to continually be offering up some human sacrifice. And where the church has wed itself to secular power, it has needed its various pilots in the same way the Jews needed Pilate. That Jew, Jesus, must die that the nation might be preserved. Maybe we could put it, the Muslim must die that we can be safe. The stranger, the alien, the poor, the naked that are at our gates must die. They must be kept out. They must be sacrificed. Christendom fused the state and church. And of course, Christendom is a description of the failed churches of Europe that are empty. It is the origins of modern atheism and agnosticism, and these reign wherever Christendom was strongest. Christendom failed largely due to the weight of the corruption of evil that it produced. But some might say, don't we need Pilate? Don't we need the strong man? Don't we need Rome? Don't we need America to harbor us safely inside the city? Christ demonstrates and explains that his kingdom is precisely not dependent upon the power of the city. The power of the city to kill. His kingdom is based on the power of to endure the cross outside the city. And we are called to meet him outside of the city precisely because of the violence of the city. Hebrews eleven twenty four. By faith, when Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He's equating the exodus of Moses out of Egypt precisely with the embrace of Christ. There is an exodus, a required exodus, before we enter the promised land. You cannot take your Christian nationalism into the city of God. Jesus explains to Pilate that his kingdom is not from this world, not of this world. Paul continually warns not to be bound by the principalities and powers of this world. The writer of Hebrews depicts Judaism and now Christianity, that is Judaism was a shadow and Christianity is a reality, as upsetting and subversive to Babel, to Egypt, to the orders of human power. Christ and Paul and the New Testament describe a faith that is not bound by law, by social expediency, by established religion, or by human government. Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. And we are receiving a kingdom, the writer of Hebrews says, that cannot be shaken. This kingdom is not subject to decay and death and removal. It is not subject to religious change. The change of high priest, you know, or political change. The change of the king. We do not depend upon the political powers of this world to establish Jesus as king. Jesus, the priest king, is the same yesterday and today and forever. Nationalism, like Zionism and paganism, needs their king. And now American Christian nationalism has turned once again to the cult of kings. 
The king is the embodiment of the law. He is always immune from prosecution. As this law is human, earthly, and not heavenly. Both Hebrews and Paul describe the most powerful of institutions, Mosaic law, Mosaic religion, as insufficient. The temple, the high priest, these are shadows. Having been delivered only by an angel through a mere human mediator and had operated only as probationary, he calls it a disciplinarian, till Christ sets us free. The turn back now to the elementary principles. To enshrine the Constitution as equal with the Word of God. That must be the ultimate blasphemy. On the order of replacing the Gospel with Torah. Look at chapter 12, verse 18 to 24. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Christianity is primarily the announcement of this new city, this new worship, this new kingdom, this breaking into, invading the normal course of time and history. Christianity so reverses the sacred truths of the established religions. You know, Christians were considered atheists. They did not uphold Rome. They were not Roman nationalists. And where this apocalyptic vision is traded for a settled way of life, you know, its own institutions, its own structures, Roman Christianity, English Christianity, Anglicanism, American Christianity, you can just go through. It seems to have entered a new sort of Christendom. One world must be relinquished, given up, abandoned. I assume this is a slow and prolonged process, but it's a very clear process. We have to depart. We have to make an exodus. We have to give up on the city of man and embrace the city of God. We embrace King Jesus and there is no other king. And going outside the city marks an authentic follower of the one who calls us to join him outside the city gates. To proclaim the city of man as if it is the city of God or to proclaim the word of man as if it is the word of God is the ultimate perversion. If the gospel is the most powerful force for good, to pervert this force, this force then becomes maybe the most powerful force of evil. And of course that is what Paul and the New Testament writers are trying to combat. You know, when you look at the Antichrist in the book of John, it is not some obviously diabolical figure. He told them to look for the Antichrist in the church. Look at the false teachers which have infiltrated the church. The false gospel that they are promising is precisely the false gospel, I believe, which has taken hold all around us. The false teachers are, in the first century, the Jewish nationalists. But aren't the false teachers of our own day, the Zionists, the colonizers, who would reify the law and human nationalism? And of course, they wanted the Gentile believers to become Jewish. They want them to be circumcised, to observe the Torah. The equivalent of equating America or the Constitution with the Bible. 
You have to become American to be a Christian. This false gospel is the enemy of the gospel. It reifies parts of culture as God-given so that you must be saved through a particular national identity. This is the heresy that the New Testament is written against. Neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, but all then are one in Christ. Pope Boniface the eight said it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff that is Roman Catholicism this is just an ongoing Constantinian Christianity it demanded a complete conformity on the order of the Judaizers and of course this is not simply a Catholic problem we have manifest destiny among Protestants. The version of exercising Christian sovereignty and destroying people in the name of Christ. As late as 1946, the Supreme Court under Justice Stanley Reed upheld the notion that sovereignty coincided with being Christian. And so today we have the fusion of right-wing politics, Christian nationalism, the pervasive notion in evangelical Christianity. And it has a history reaching back to the Puritan notion that the United States was God's city, a city set upon a hill, as John Winthrop put it. And this easily morphed into American exceptionalism, America first. This presumption of a Christian nationalism, of Christian privilege, of equating being a good American with being Christian. It overlaps with racial subjugation in Christian nationalism, which is actually white Christian nationalism. A careless account of the history of Israel can endorse a sacred nation and can be detected, I think, in any form of militant Zionism. And so evangelicals collect hundreds of millions of dollars each year for Israel. And what's even more significant is the political influence, all of it re rooted in an unshakable belief in the return of the Messiah in Israel. Paul consistently describes the fulfillment of the promises to Israel through Christ. The church is the true Israel. And this group continues to promote the notion of Judaism, nationalism, the notion of the law. And in no way is Christianity dependent upon a modern Zionism or any form of a holy nation. And of course these ideas came to America with the Puritans. It accompanied the colonists escaping religious persecution in England. Israel was pictured as a metaphor for the United States. John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, said in 1630, the United States is the city set on a hill. And in such a belief system, the indigenous people were, of course, considered against God's plan. They were considered disposable. The Jews killed by Germans. The natives slaughtered all over the world by Portuguese Christians, Spanish, English, American Christians. The Palestinians being slaughtered on a daily basis due to the support of Christian Zionists, have a vested interest in whether Christians see salvation in terms of Christian nationalism, or whether we believe in the authenticity of the gospel. And so I think it's time that the followers of Jesus be followers of Jesus, before anything else, before nationality, before political party, before race, before ethnicity, before gender, before geography, our identity in Christ precedes every other identity. Let's close, look at Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Forging Plowshares is a community dedicated to cultivating the peaceful kingdom by providing in-depth, transformative biblical and theological education and discipleship. If you have found this podcast valuable, please remember to share on social media. If you have questions about what you've heard, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved with Forging Plowshares or even support this ministry financially, please visit our website, forgingplowshares.org.